que eu vou apresentar rapidamente. A, enfim, a professora Guilherme Bruno é uma professora muito conhecida e reconhecida na área de estudos de cinema, arquitetura, mídia e artes visuais. Recentemente, ela publicou esse livro, Superfície, uh, questões de, material, de questões de materialidade, estética e mídia. Uh, nós estamos tentando traduzir para o ano que vem esse livro chamado Atlas da Atlas das Emoções, é, Jornadas em Arquitetura, Filme e Artes Visuais, que se tornou um livro seminal para esse campo né, tão fundamental né, para quem está estudando teoria da imagem, cinema, filme, mídia, etc. Um livro que foi premiado em 2003, considerado o melhor livro do ano, no, nessa área de, de estudos, assim como a professora Guilherme Bruno tem outros livros premiados, como, agora, a gente fez uma tradução aqui, o Prostituta sobre o Mapa de Ruínas, né, um livro dedicado à cineasta italiana do início do século XX, Elvira Notari. Né, foi um livro que também ganhou prêmio pela Associação de Estudos de Cinema, dos Estados Unidos e uh, tam ela também tem publicado o uh, Intimidade Pública sobre Arquitetura e Artes Visuais. É, para quem não ainda leu, recomendo os livros da professora Giuliana Bruno, né, que são público e notoriamente bem reconhecidos. Sem mais, então, delongas, eu passo a palavra para ela e agradeço especialmente ao Paulo Herkenhoff e à Angélica Padovani, que uh, foram fundamentais para trazer a professora Giuliana Bruno e agradeço enormemente a presença dela conosco. Muito obrigado. I'm sorry that I do not speak Portuguese. <laughs> uh, I am Italian, so I understand a little bit. Uh, I speak some French and some Spanish, so I can get there, but not quite enough uh, for this. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Tadeu Capistrano for this fantastic uh, invitation. I'm really happy to be here and very honored and grateful. And thanks to the Museo de Arte and its director, Paolo Herkendorf, also for the invitation. And also, last but not least, thanks to all of you for being here. I look forward to our dialogue after uh, the talk. Uh, I was very interested in uh, Tadeu's uh, idea of the spirit of cinema and very intrigued by uh, the entire series that he has put together with many wonderful speakers whose work I very much am in dialogue with. And I'm looking uh, forward to the uh, completion of the publication and, uh, and, and the entire sense of the course. Um, I was interested in uh, Tadeu's idea in particular of connecting cinema to other fields. Uh, this is something that matters very much uh, to me, especially the relation between film and art. Uh, now, in particular, I work on contemporary art. Uh, and in general, the sense of connection between the visual field and other cultural, aesthetic, and also scientific uh, practices. So today, I will address the scientific imaginary and its relation to aesthetic uh, practices. Um, and I'd like to uh, tell you uh, the story of a forgotten history. Um, digging into the field of media archaeology, uh, I'd like to present some original archival research that I did uh, at Harvard University around the figure of Hugo Munsterberg, who was a philosopher uh, and a psychologist who, in 1916, wrote the first systematic book in film theory. So what I want to look at in particular in the spirit of the spirit of cinema is this intersection between the emergence of the discourse of film theory and uh, the, the history of science and aesthetic practices. And so to um, put you 
in the mood, let me activate this. Um, here is an image from 1929 that shows the mind functioning as if it was a cinematic apparatus, that is to say, the brain as a screen. So let's imagine this scientific imaginary of a brain and a screen. Imagine a room, a mental space, a film theater. Now place yourself in a psychological laboratory at the turn of the last century, around 1890s. Think of a space full of objects suspended in the eerie silence of thought, a place where instruments alone make ambient noise, mechanical, intermittent, insistent, and repetitive. This noise makes me think of the sound made by a film projector. Indeed, the entire atmosphere of the lab reminds me of the art of projection. In this kind of laboratory, as if one was in a film theater, the mood is one of absorption in visual technology. People are engrossed in observant silence. They form groups, often sitting in ordered rows, looking at visual apparatuses, immersed in a mental exercise that both isolates them and connects them together. In this particular space of mental, visual experimentation, one is engaged, captivated, enveloped, and consumed in observation. The object and images that move as the mind races by are mesmerizing. The laboratory I'm describing is that of Hugo Munsterberg, who was born in 1863 and died in 1916. Munsterberg was a German philosopher and psychologist who emigrated to the United States and pioneered the scholarly study of film. In 1916, he published his book, The Photoplay, a Psychological Study, which was the first substantial book of film theory ever to be published. I wish to offer today an analysis of the experimental laboratory that he led at Harvard University to explore the ways in which science, psychology, and aesthetic intersected with visual representation at the very moment of the invention of cinema and at the cusp of modernity. I also like to show that the analytic aspect of film studies and the actual tools intellectual tools of film theory were born as instruments in the cultural location of a scientific laboratory. Munsterberg's work articulated an inventive cultural conjunction around various instruments of knowledge, including knowledge of the self. In this laboratory of representational apparatuses, scientific research on mental processes, on the way the mind works were connected with the expression of affects and came to be linked to image technology, particularly the art and industry of film. The encounter of science and imaging on psychic grounds was an important part of modernity's innovative quest. Yet, Despite having stood at the crossroad of this crucial cultural confluence, Munsterberg, who was the most popularly recognized psychologist in the United States during his lifetime, is now largely forgotten. This is a scholar who contributed to the invention of the lie detector and also wrote not just for scientific journals, but also for very popular periodicals such as Cosmopolitan, McClure's, and even Mother's Magazine. Yet, despite how popular he was in his lifetime, today he no longer inhabits the popular imagination. No one knows who he is anymore. Furthermore, in the Academy, his research on film is not being clearly acknowledged as central to the field of psychology. He's better known in psychology for his work on social and industrial efficiency and modern fatigue, but this work has been not put in connection with the effects of the cinema. Conversely, Monsterberg's psychological laboratory has been largely ignored in cinema studies. Although the importance of the pioneering 1916 book, The Photoplay, is 
recognized as a foundation of film theory, the theoretical apparatus of this book has not been given an adequate consideration in relation to the cultural and experimental context that generated this kind of thinking. The complexity of the interaction between the laboratory of experimental science and the apparatus of film imaging still needs to be explored. I'm very interested in this particular uh, relationship and in putting all of these confluences and disciplines into dialogue. Geographical serendipity led me on this path of exploration of media archaeology. I first came to see the experimental space as an important cultural location while writing my book that Tadeo mentioned, Atlas of Emotion, uh, on the interplay between motion and emotion in modernity. I was thinking and writing at the very university where Monsterberg developed his laboratory and conceived of his film theory. I'm kind of a cultural flaneur, flaneuse, and uh, I like to walk around and think uh, a lot. So I kept walking around Harvard University, the campus, and asking myself, what was this lab like? Where was it? How did it function to make space for affects in culture? Did it open door to emerging subjects and subjectivities? Munsterberg, I came to realize as I was researching this, not only devised the first full experiment in the language of film theory, but articulated his theory in a language of subjectivity that actually emerged from an experimental scientific laboratory. If he was able to write about film as an affective as well as a cognitive instrument, it was because the emotion of cinema had been instrumentally present in his laboratory. The history of science and the language of film are deeply intertwined in this epistemological architecture. The movement of mental life and the motion of cinema are adjoined on the cultural map of modernity. Here is a picture of the lab. So as modern experimental research met new forms of representation, technology became entangled with psychic life. According to Frederick Kittler, Hugo Monsterberg coined the very term psychotechnology to define the field of interaction that he was exploring. As a philosopher, Monsterberg related psychology to technology in general and to film technology in particular through the observation of their shared processes. He conceived as a psychic life as a mechanism to be unraveled, as a technology of sort. And he conversely became interested in the flow of new technology as a form of psychic projection. It was along these lines that Munsterberg recognized the psychic function of the film apparatus. He spoke of the power of filmic motion as a set of processes that replicate the inner activities of the human mind. For Munsterberg, cinema works as an actual projection of the mind. So remember this idea. Ultimately, he represented film as a psychic map, picturing our mind moving like an actual motion picture. While the scientific apparatus then pursued the mapping of the mind, it gave cinema a place within its realm, understanding film's own power as an imaginative psychic mechanism. Visiting Monsterberg's collection of instruments for measuring forms of perception gives us the actual measure of how much the birth of film and its theorization is related to the inscription of affects in time and space. Munsterberg observed that the kinesthetic properties of our cinematic machine result in a transport, that is, they can carry us away and around. In his world, in film, quote, not more than one sixteenth of a second is needed to carry us from one corner of the globe to the other, from a jubilant scene to a mourning scene. The whole keyboard of the imagination may be used for this 
emotionalizing of nature, end quote. The venture that Monsterberg describes is significantly marked with Stimmung, an important notion of German aesthetics, and resonates in particular with the atmospheric sense of the idea of Stimmung. This passage also bears the trace of geographical discovery. The cinema can take us from one corner to the globe to the next, and the imprint of physiological imaging. It thus creates, through several moving lenses, a modern exploration of the surface of the world as an atmosphere. Above all, the type of aesthetic venture that Monsterberg described is an intimate voyage, a tour of the emotions. In drawing a psychic landscape, he made a theory of what my, one may call emotion pictures, which made room for the navigation of feeling and charged cinema with the actual moving power of emotion. Most importantly, it understood a specific kind of transport, the movement of empathy, which actually engages the dynamic of mood and at the atmospheric of space. He spoke of not only of an emotionalizing of nature, but of an emotional setting, recognizing the geography of affects, the fact that affects not only constitute a space, but also affect our perception of sights. In speaking of affects as atmosphere, he claimed that, and I quote, the feeling of the soul emanates into its surrounding, and conversely, an environment can express a mood, end quote. For Munsterberg, the power of cinema lies in this aesthetic relational ability, an empathetic transport, a voyage from inside to the outside. His theory evokes the 19th century aesthetic notion of Einfühlung, a form of empathy. As the German psychologist Theodor Lips wrote at the turn of the last century, Einfühlung is a mim mimesis or a transfer that's activated between the subject and its surrounding. For Theodor Lips, one does not only empathize with people, but also with objects, with spaces, with the expressive, dynamic form of architecture, with color, with sounds, with scenery and situations, with atmospheres and moods. In the photoplay, Monsterberg recognizes such projections of Einfühlung, showing that, and I quote, depth and movement come alike to us in the moving picture world, not as a hard facts, but as a mixture. They're present, and yet they're not in the things. It is us who invest the impressions with them, end quote. So it's interesting that a scientist is saying that things are not in the things and in hard facts, but actually in this interaction between the subjective world and the objective world. Ultimately, in Monster Get Views, and I quote, cinema tells the human story by overcoming altogether the forms of the outer world, that is, space, time, and causality, and adjusting the outer events to the forms of the inner world, namely attention, memory, imagination, and emotion. This affirmation of the transitive and pathetic power of cinema is a synthesis of Monsterberg's laboratory work, often conducted, interestingly, as you see here, with screen-like instruments. It almost looks as if the uh, uh, people are looking at computer screens or iPads. Uh, so it's interesting that the screen uh, and the brain connect. The chapter heading of his 1916 book on film, which describes the psychology of cinema in sections entitled Depth and Movement, Attention, Memory and Imagination, and Emotions, correspond precisely to the actual category of scientific experiments that he conducted in the Harvard Psychological Laboratory. So it's the conceptual architecture of the film theory book stands on solid ground as it is built upon Munsterberg's body of experimental research. He reproduces the actual geography of the laboratory with research that makes room for the atmosphere of psychic transfers. To account for the mnemonic, imaginative, and emotional impact of the moving image, Munsterberg pushed the psychophysiological direction that he had emerged in the philosophy of psychic life present in his lab. 
His modern physiological view of the psychic was based on a deep interest in the sensorium and in sensations. Monsterberg understood the cinema to be a vehicle of physiological activity and played his emotion in the moving realm of sensations. For him, film makes an impression which comes into our visual sense in the form of a sensation that impacts our body, and this bodily sensorium then becomes the basis for an emotional knowledge. In the way in which it explained the relation of the film sense to emotion, Munsterberg's physiological psychology anticipates a neuroesthetic approach. In his view, art is sensation and also conveys a sentient transmission of affects. When claiming that filming emotion engages a sensory transformation, Monsterberg leaps into the realm of what today is contemporary neuroesthetics. He foregrounds the connective views of neuroesthetics, envisioning what Gilles Deleuze much later affirmed, the brain is the screen. In Monsterberg's hands, spectatorship thus became conceived as an actual cell of mental and psychic life. A scientific apparatus so was applied to measure film psychophysiological interaction with the inner life of sensing, the atmosphere of imaging, reminiscing, and feeling. As the psychological research turned into film theory, it touched on the material fiber of a passion to reimagine, remember, and reinvent the tactile, moody surface of subjective experience. How instrumental this area of research might have been for future work of neuroesthetics can be further understood by taking a closer look at the laboratory of emotion pictures. Because Munsterberg arrived at film after testing neurological flux with scientific instruments, he was able to see that the cinema is itself an instrument, a tool of mental projection. The Harvard Psychological Laboratory was in many ways the product of late 19th century conjunction of philosophy and psychology with aesthetics. It, the experiments followed the line of experimentation that was pioneered by Duchesne de Boulogne, whose method was transformed by Charcot, who was his most famous student and studied hypnosis and, and hysteria. And, um, who also transformed that into a kind of pre-filmic theatrics. Duchesne had paved the way for the line of experimentation that connected photography and eventually motion pictures to the study of affects. His book, Mécanisme de la Physionomie Humaine, published in 1862, Mechanism of Human Physiognomy, intended to make, and I quote, the expression of passions applicable to the arts, and especially the plastic arts. Duchesne Photographic Archive was in turn used, actually, in the book of Charles Darwin, uh, the one he wrote in 1872, to illustrate a groundbreaking work on emotion called The Expression of Emotions in Men and Animals, which is, exhibits Duchesne's photographs in a kind of torturous athletics of human emotion in an effort to actually locate the place of emotion as neuroscience does today in muscular tissue in certain places of the brain and the apparatus of movement, scientific research engineer a sensational mechanics of passion that by way of photography access the terrain of the visual arts. So science and aesthetics met on the ground of photography and led into a conjunction to the visual arts. Hugo Monsterberg was a former student of Willem Wundt and took this research further by pursuing the psychomechanics of sensation and the haptic physiology of affects and making advances on neuroesthetics, eventually connected the sentient mechanic of emotions to the language of motion pictures. His ability to do so was the result of a very productive encounter with the eminent philosopher and psychologist William James. It was William James who discovered Munsterberg as a very young scholar, becoming a supporter in his work in its early phase. 
In 1892, at age 29, Monsterberg was invited by William James to Harvard to direct the newly created Harvard Psychological Laboratory, which the maverick philosopher and psychologist had actually founded the year before. This lab was the actual product of William James' work and was one of the most important, arguably the most important laboratory in the United States. The main thrust of William James' philosophical vision, as Jonathan Crary has also pointed out, was to offer a kind of fluid, dynamic model of mental activity. He was interested in subjective experience and had also not shunned away from considering the affects and the emotions and the imagination in conjunction with the work of memory and the perception of movement and linking also sensations to affects. As William James put it in the principle of psychology, the foundational work of psychology that actually founded the discipline, published in 1890, through his work he had come to realize, and I quote, how much our mental life is knit up with our corpo, with our corporeal frame. So here, for example, are uh, the, uh, the slides that William James was using in his lectures at Harvard, in, and you can see how interested he was, in a way, in, in, in constantly exploring even the kind of fiber of the human body, the very beautiful uh, glass slides. In the view of William James, the mind and the body are knit up to such an extent that affects are interwoven with sensational processes and physical manifestation. James ventured to say that, I quote, Bodily changes actually follow the perception of the exciting fact, and our feeling of the same change is the actual emotion, end quote. He posited ultimately that an affect could not be even cognitively perceived if it was separated from the situation that, from which it emerged and from what he called a form of reverberation. In claiming that the intellectual life is totally bound up to inner life, James opposed what he actually termed, and I quote, a feedingless cognition. It's interesting uh, to me that uh, cognition is much connected to the idea of feeling. So there is no feelingless cognition. It's what Damasio, the current neuroscientist, is saying today by talking about the feeling brain in some way. James understood that affect are implanted in the fabric of our cognitive and inquisitive being. Emotion is not on the other side, but it's actually the inner movement that drives our very desire to know. Such a way of thinking of what he liked to term mental moods is very modern. In a way, the ultimate advance brought about by modernity's own characteristic motion is that knowledge and affects are linked because they can move together and also move us. In the early formulation, Munsterberg views were very close to G William James' own conceptual idea of mental life. If his early material viewpoint migrated into an experimental vision, later becoming the very basis of his interest in film, it is really due to William James's influence. After assuming the directorship of the psychological laboratory at James's invitation, Munsterberg would extend the range of psychological theories into a wide array of cultural phenomena, including aesthetics, philosophy, art, pedagogy, but also industry, politics, and law. Hugo Monsterberg himself invites us to visit the laboratory of experimental um, psychology that he took over from William James, considered, as I mentioned, the most important in the United States. In an 1893 reflection on the actual concepts that animated his philosophy and the new psychology and the forms of experimentations that he took, his description of the goals and the activity of the lab is spatial, and it enables us to actually imagine the kind of cultural landscape housed in the laboratory, and even to experience the atmosphere and the sound. And I, I quote from his uh, description of his lab. The upper rooms of Harvard's Dane Hall, in which for so many years the law school carried out very quiet work, has recently become filled with noise. Electromagnets snap, tuning forks resound, the chronoscope 
wears. Hammering and sawings are heard, and the discussions are no longer concerning legal cases and decisions, but rather concerning sensations and affects, ideas, feelings, emotions, motives, and will. Over the door stands in large letters, psychological laboratory, end quote. Arguing against conjectures very common at the time that experimental psychology treats only of spiritualistic experiments and that nothing less than vivisection is in question, he presented a large composite pictures of the instruments of knowledge present in the lab. Munsterberg linked the experimentation to a larger philosophical quest, as well as advances in physiology and physics, and especially in picturing sense organs, motion, nerves, the functioning of the brain, and even borrowed from astronomy an understanding of time and of the experience of time passing. All these methods were figured all together to understand cognitive functions that included mnemonics, desires and reflection, and for exploring the duration of mental acts and the relation of external stimuli to sensations. Equipped from, with this large epistemological background, the scientific lab was to study, and I quote, the relation between the outer processes and the inner states, end quote. A perspective that would become the crux of his film theory that was sensitive to the dynamics of empathy and focused on the relation between what he called the outer and the inner development of moving pictures. In stating that, quote, to show the significance of the experimental method for the high and most complicated phenomena of mental life has become the goal of our labors, Munsterberg integrated the world of memory and temporality in his field of inquiry. In order to make this research on mental life more tangible, Munsterberg himself can be of help to us and become a guide because he wrote a text that actually took the reader for a walk inside his laboratory, offering a kind of view of mental processes as they were actually placed in the lab. So let's listen to his description. A stroll through the workroom, he says, even outside of working hours, permits one to see clearly the high development of the lab from a glance of the apparatuses stored in glass cases. There are four great groups of contrivances that can be easily distinguished. First, the apparatus intended to illustrate the relation between the mind and the body through the representation of the brain, nerves, sense organs, costly models of the brain, the eye, and the ear with detachable parts, valuable models of nerve paths, fine preservations in wax of brains, and dissected parts in alcohol are all in the lab." End quote. Munsterberg starts, he stroll through of the lab from the very site of the body in order to evidence the anatomical and physiological base of the kind of cognitive and emotional apparatus that he's experimenting upon. The instrument he mentions in this kind of architectural promenade through the lab convey the sense of their form through the actual form, material form of their design. As I looked at some of these objects that emerged from extremely dusty boxes stored away in basements. Uh, I could see in, in the actual sense of the texture of the materiality of the research. The uncanny aesthetic artifacts had a kind of tactile, haptic quality. They were coated with beautiful, elaborate brush strokes, rich in chromatic nuances. As objects of design, they stimulate a curiosity to survey the surface of the body, and they impel us to explore the landscape that lies within. These instruments of knowledge appear to actually call for touch, seeking the hand of the experimenter to be laid upon them and to grow beneath corporeal surface. Passing by the humani corporis fabrica, the actual fiber of the human body, from the fabric of the corporeal landscape, we access the physiology of the senses. The section of the lab, Monsterberg says, and I quote, is the most imposing. Eye and ear have equal recognition. 
a copious collection composed of tuning forks, an organ, a harmonica, pipes, resonators, etc., served for psychological acoustics. Color mixers of various parts and even a dark room served for psychological optics." End quote. Optical research is by no means the only site of investigations here. In Munsterberg's lab, the eye is not chosen to represent hierarchically the subject and the self, but is interestingly paired with other forms of sensory expression. So unlike many forms of Western thinking where the eye, the eye is above the touch or all other senses, here you have an integration and an interest in the combination of them. The lab was especially tuned to psychological acoustics. I, one in the lab could hear actually the actual sound even made by mental life and as a rhythm of psychic change was experimented on. Eye and ear enjoyed equal status in the laboratory and the other senses Monsterberg himself says, and I quote, are not forgotten. Complicated touch and temperature apparatuses and the instrument for the study of the sensation of movement have an important place in the picturing of mental life, end quote. As we continue our stroll through the laboratory, Munsterberg informs us that, quote, of greatest value is the incomparably rich collection of instruments belonging to the section number three. They serve for the time measurements of psychical acts. The more the resources are developed here, the deeper the glance we gain into the actual structure of the mental organism, end quote. He observed mental life as an organism and noting that, quote, clocks have the somewhat the same importance for us that the microscope had for the anatomist. The interesting parallel highlights the centrality of time and temporality, which was actually anatomized in the research. The observation of temporal matters was mainly achieved through the use of a chronoscope of Munsterberg's invention, which you see here, along with a variety of tuning forks registering the variety of psychophysiological reactions, including involuntary ones. Through a kind of dissection of time, of the rhythm and duration of mental life, Lou Munsterberg really carefully observed how we think. It's interesting that on it is exactly on this same ground that film and science met elsewhere in the experimental research of Edouard Moybridge and Julietienne Marais. The sectioning and sequencing of time and the search for the movement of time turned the history of science into the language of cinema as the experiments of Moybridge and Marais, among others, analytically parsed the leap of time that took us from laboratory to film. The emergence for film then was taking place in the very space of scientific research on time and time travel that saw the emergence of film theory. As we continue our cinematic promenade through Munsterberg's lab, we enter the fourth section, which included, Munsterberg says, all the apparatus that serve exclusively for the investigation of higher mental processes, such as how we perceive time and space, how we understand memory, how we understand attention, feeling and emotion. Apparatus, he says, for the study of aesthetic feelings and the expression of affects. Exactly in this department, he continues, the tiny mechanical workshop of our laboratory has proven the most useful, end quote. The fourth section of the Harvard Psychological Laboratory, the most important and cherished of the whole enterprise, housed the research that most directly transferred into a theory of film. Monsterberg, in fact, saw film as an expression of mental life and of the psychic energy that comes from mental life and explored it in his book on film theory, the photoplay, according to the categories of depth and movement, attention, memory and imagination, and emotions. These filmic processes are the actual categories of the higher mental processes that he experimented and explored upon in the lab, which include, as the description I just quoted clarifies, the perception of space and time, memory and attention, feelings and emotion, end quote. Film theory, therefore, became a kind of real extension of laboratory research on mental picturing and of the psychic geography that connected the film book. So 
the actual architecture of the film book was molded upon the architecture, the conceptual architecture of the laboratory. In this cultural transfer between the two, we can observe how the making of the self itself was created. For Monsterberg, the higher functions of mental life are not restricted to cognitive functions, but include the imaginative work of remembering and affection. And film expresses with precision the very way in which our mind works beyond cognition. As it shows the depth of movement of psychic phenomenon, film makes manifest all of its elusive inner mechanism. The film apparatus exhibits them on a screen, which is like the mind's own screen. Mental picturing is itself fully materialized in moving images, and the language of cinema becomes the actual register of the rhythm of inner life, a projection of our own subjective existence. So moving images are a laboratory of emotion here, and they can move indeed. If we consider Monsterberg's laboratory and his film theory, as a product of the culture of modernity, of the intersection of aesthetic psychology uh, on aesthetic ground, it is also interesting to discover that the encounter among all of these disciplines and ways of thinking also involved the space of another important space of modernity, world exhibitions. World exhibitions were, together with the architectures of transit, one of the ways in which modernity expressed its own desire uh, for, for movement and for display. It's interesting that the instruments of science and the apparatus of film were both exhibited in world exhibitions. In turn, world exhibitions were also filmed in many panorama films of the modern era, such as Edison's Panorama of Paris Exposition from 1900 or Pan American Exposition by Night from 1901. Innovative visual technology and new media, such as film, together with new sciences, such as psychology, were displayed and took active part in the display of modern culture at world expositions. Monsterberg himself was involved in this process, and he contributed to the establishment of scientific congresses in locations that included world expositions. He participated in the 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition in Chicago, which a picture from that time you see here, where he displayed the work of his laboratory and even prepared an exhibition catalog. One of his life achievements was the organization of an international congress of, that connected together scientists and artists, arts and science, in conjunction with the St. Louis World Fair of 1904. The catalog of the exhibition at the Chicago World Fair offers an, uh, an idea of what kind of objects and, uh, and instruments of research he was uh, displaying there. Among them, there were a number of pre-cinematic devices. So in the scientific lab involved the kind of the whole world of pre-cinema, including magic lanterns, the stereoscope, the stroboscope, and the zoetrope, a rotating device that you see here that makes images move. And that is, in a way, the precursor of the idea of, of, of cinema. A number of motion apparatuses were showed, together with haptic instruments, he says, for studying the muscle sensation, tactual space, and the presentation of movement, time sense accompanied space sense. We're positioned in an interesting territory that Monsterberg defines as tactile space, tactual space, where touch is spatial and space is tangible with more than 200 arrangements for studying the number of extensions and the sensation that one feels on the skin, the skin itself became the measure of our understanding of the, not only of mental life, but our changing environment. In this tactile way, the laboratory tested the borders between the inner and the outer space and the shifting perimeter of spatial empathy. The material displayed at the World Columbian Exhibition included 400 photographs as well as picture books. Among the visual documents that I was able to find, there were experiments for detecting uh, emotion uh, which appeared to be particularly cinematic. 
For example, there were a number of painterly sequences, montage of faces, which you see here, used to study the expression of affects. The idea was derived from physiognomy, and it, it is that the inner life actually transpires on the skin, on the outside, and can be read as it is impressed on someone's face. The laboratory tested the materiality of emotion as imprinted on one's own facial expression. Silent cinema, which was also an air of physiognomic discourse, would continue this line of emotional mapping across art and science, insisting on facial close-up and enhancing the importance of the facial close-up to give us the sense of emotion in film. So would also film theory, especially in the formulation of Bella Balash, who pioneered an understanding of affect in film in terms of a microphysiognomy. Balash offered an animated reading of visual life that extended from the human face to the actual face of things and objects. Monsterberg experiments borrowed from physiognomy, but in some way went beyond it. They concerned the moving montage of the emotion, which was recognized in his film theory by way of his experimentation in the lab. Cinematic indeed in these experiments is the attention given to the movement of affects. Here, a singular face is not significant per se, and it is the combination, the juxtaposition, and the succession of the expression that can create affect. I'm reminding here of what was known as the Kuleshov effect. Um, it's, uh, it's an experiment that actually Kuleshov, who was interested in biomechanics, a Soviet director did, uh, using a series of facial expression and associating them by way of editing to different situations. The idea was that you could use the same face of a person and then attach it together by way of montage to a different situation and the audience would read it differently, even if it was the same face. So let's say you had the same face of a woman and in front you had a bowl of soup and the audience would think, hungry, the person is hungry. And then you use the same face of the person but like show a funeral and somebody would say, how sad, you know, the person is sad. But the fact is that the face didn't change, it's the montage that makes it connected together. So it's very similar to these experiments that were done in this lab to study how the montages of different uh, parts can create different emotions. So in the same face, you would see love and hate, anger and joy, depending on the actual following a montage of the sequence. So the filmmaker's test was like a scientific test, it was about affective montage as a form of empathy. This kind of experimentation understood that it is the dynamic of motion that creates an emotion, which is itself always in movement. Displayed at the World Exposition were apparatuses that probed cinematic phenomenon, including an instrument for studying the movements during the emotions. The hypothesis tested in the lab was that emotion provokes an effect in the body, profoundly affecting it, and the emotional effect can be physically detected by actually tracing the subtle movements that happen, not just on the skin, but even in the kind of mechanics of the body. To this effect, Munsterberg used several instruments designed after Julietien Marais, and you see one of them here. Um, so the graphic idea of emotion was actually a trace of motion that connected the two together. In this laboratory, cinema was a memory trace left by the future. The instruments of the World Columbian Exposition designed a worldview. Take, for example, the memory apparatus called Instrument for Studying Association and Memory. Memory was fashioned like a black box. Inside the box, a rotating device showed the sequences of images that elicited the response of an audience. The architecture of this instrument, figured as a black box of moving images, prefigures the dark room of the film theater. This memory apparatus is none other than the apparatus we know as film. It displays the particular memory theater, which is the cinema. The shadow rooms of moving pictures, a camera obscura of memory, traveled from lab to film. It is no wonder, then, that this geography of mnemonic, associative, affective, 
empathetic space devised in a scientific lab could actually turn into the intellectual space of film theory. If the instruments of knowledge displayed in the psychological laboratory turned into the theoretical tools that crafted the cinematic apparatus as a psychic instrument, it was also due to the form of their manufacture. To further understand the design of mental life, we need to pay more attention to the instrument as actual objects of design and objects of material culture. I wish to emphasize here a kind of an aesthetics of materiality, and I'm especially interested in surface materiality. I want to explore further what Jacques Rancière calls the surface of design. If I speak of design, it's what interests me is the manner in which by tracing lines, disposing words, or organizing surfaces, one designs a shared common space a configuration of what's visible and what's thinkable, a form of actual habitation of the sensible world. The instruments in Monsterberg's lab were aesthetically rendered when designed, and he was very aware of the texture of his objects, which circulated meaning beyond the history of technology. So that's the other idea, is not to get stuck in the idea of just speaking of inventions, but looking at these instruments as actual cultural and even aesthetic artifacts outside of the idea of what came first or, or later or how they actually even function. What I'm interested in is that these objects rendered palpable new worlds and they made them thinkable by the fact that they existed themselves in this form of material culture, creating a space of imaginary circulation between science and the visual arts. They were like modern cabinets of curiosities because they were arranged in photographs as if they were arranged for an art installation. The photographs of the lab were not very scientific, they were actually staged as if they were as an installation. Their composition displayed like a collagist effect, an aesthetic of collage, as you see here, as in the case of instruments for the experimentation on site, that were almost look like a kind of avant-gardist uh, machine. They look like paintings or collage by Leger. In describing the lab, Monsterberg drew attention to the way the instruments were fashioned. He said, copious supplies of wood and glass, of brass and cotton wadding, all the varieties of paper and iron tools, wires and tubes, physical and chemical paraphernalia, enables us to continually adapt the instruments to our question. Speaking of the design of the tools, he emphasized a tangible quality a flexibility, a malleability. The material versatility, the actual making of the objects, enabled a sort of methodological adaptability, making them suited to a variety of epistemic questions. So the instrument had to be malleable in order to be able for the actual question, the quest, to be more open, and vice versa. The more open the quest, the more you would make instruments that could transform and change the epistemic questions. They displayed and they had a transformative ability. The design of the object was a question of manufacture and the, they designed ideas in a sense in this way that were suitable to a kind of handicraft style making. It was interesting to me, not being a scientist, that some of these instruments didn't look scientific at all, but had a very ordinary feel, a sort of even quotidian appearance. For example, the instruments for detecting color were conducted by using very simple colorful batches of wood, of wool. They looked like Precisely like this, uh, the scientific setting, ultimately we wove a kind of familiar scenes, refashioning the balls of thread that women used to knit in 19th century parlors, as well as, and that was even more interesting to me, the way they experienced time. Um, the fabric of color, the textural manifestation, as was the object of inquiry with this very simple, in a sense, material. The lab made scientific discovery about mental activity by learning from the fabric of everyday life, from the instruments of everyday life, the objects and the texture even of domestic space. The case of the anti-rayoscope anti one of the most famous objects of the lab, 
is perhaps the most telling. This object created what's commonly known as the waterfall illusion. It was a tall, upright, rectangular stripe object that was used to explain the illusion of movement and study the perceptual effect of the illusion of movement. The person stares at the central inset of stripes when the lights are set in rotating motion by a crank. When the motion is stopped, one continues to see the object moving, even if the motion has stopped, and may even experience motion going in the opposite direction. This instrument was very important for film because it, it displays what was known as the after image effect that was very long used to explain how movement happens in film. As we know, if we look at a film strip, nothing moves. It's a series of still images, and yet we have this impression of movement. So this was the instrument that was used to explain how come stillness can become motion even when motion is not there, because you stop motion here and you constantly see it. Now, it's interesting to me that this instrument actually tells uh, what cinema is uh, and how a, still, a series of still images can appear projected as a flow of images. So it was like a waterfall became the flow of images. In the water flow of images that is cinema, the images are impressed on celluloid and they're made, not made of fabric. This instrument was very famous for having been handmade. It was, uh, the story goes that it was cut and sewn together from the bathing suit of the wife of a professor. Yeah. In fact, I mean, if you look at it closely, even has feet, it looks like one of those 19th century bathing suits that, uh, that women used to use, like all covering themselves uh, with it. Scientific instruments, therefore, can tell a story uh, and a fictional, have a fictional life. And it was a kind of imaginative tale that suggested that the myth of cinema's actual origin lies in women's fashion. Thinking of these instruments, among others, as an object of design and as a subject of material culture, I could see how we fashion movement while fabricating the activity of mental flow. The psychological laboratory materially interwrought the flow of motion with an emotional fabric in a manner that was closely connected to its times and knit to the fabrics of it, the everyday life, its coloring and apparel. The laboratory even sculpted the material and matters of life, delving into the fabric of life designed the world of affects. With regard to the emotion of modern motion, many cinematic feelings were conveyed in the actual shape of Monsterberg's instruments. A special significance is a swaying chair that was used to study hypnosis and disorientation and that belonged to the experimental section of the lab that was connected to association memory, feeling, and emotion, to that section which, I, as I mentioned, was devoted to the epistemological categories that Monsterberg recognized to be the actual basis of film, film in his book on film theory, The Photoplay. In an image of, of the instrument that you see here, the hypnotic chair is positioned inside a spherical contraption and attached to a mechanism that makes it rotate. A man is sitting, chained to the chair, and is about to spin. The speed of motion provokes a sensation of dizziness, which Monsterberg suggested can affect one's sense of place and even one's grasp of the location of sound. The ex experiment in the sound of moving dizziness makes apparent what became the physical material base of cinematic affect. It speaks to me of the imaginary chains of spectatorial absorption. You're chained to a, to a chair, in a way, as a spectator. But also feeling of electrifying dislocation and hypnotic experience, which is what we sense in film. In the same place of affective display in which one finds the swaying hypnotic chair, there was also a hypnoscope. The laboratory bought the hypnoscope in 1890, at the very moment in which cinema was invented. The instrument has two sets of clockwork-driven mirrors that move in different directions, and they're designed to spin out, activating the mirrors of reflection as a state of mind, and creating a kind of hypnotic, absorptive condition. The, the design of this instrument is 
quite cinematic, no wonder the hypnotic, mesmerizing, animating, moving power of cinema came to be theoretically, intellectually born in this laboratory out of a series of spinning apparatuses that registered the flow of mental life. We've observed how this instrument designed a modern sensibility and a fluid experience of subjectivity. But who was using them? Who was activating them? Who were the subjects of this lab? The photographs of the psychological laboratory, where they didn't show any people, mostly showed men at work posing for the camera in frontal views and sometimes as they performed tasks. At the time, women were not admitted to Harvard, but they could only go to a college called Radcliffe that was called, and I'm not joking here, the Harvard Annex, kind of. You know. it's, it's quite amazing. This, in a way, explained to me, at some level, why I couldn't find any pictures of women in this laboratory. But then, um, but then I... I, I I was more curious. I wanted to go further in this because uh, even if they weren't represented, it turns out women were there. Munsterberg taught at Radcliffe routinely. He was interested in women's education and even trained Mary Whitton Cockings, a very eminent psychologist who was, at Munsterberg's request, given permission to work at, at the Harvard Psychological Laboratory. He uh, talked to the Harvard's president to give her a Harvard PhD, but the president said no, women couldn't get a Harvard PhD uh, at the time. But it turns out that Hawkins was not the only woman. I kept digging into the archives for visual records, trying to find uh, out about the story, and eventually a photograph of a woman working in the lab emerged. Finally, there she was, leaving over her experiments, intent on repetitive, obsessive observation. I wondered how she was using an instrument that I particularly liked, which I like to have. It was called the Wave Writer. Um, the Wave Writer was ever present in the laboratory and was used to record the fluid rhythm of thought, to graph an emotional wave or even style a mood. After all, a female student of Monsterberg wrote uh, a testimony and claimed that the work gave women personal access to a new subjective world. I found this reminiscent, she said. We dissected our sensory selves and examined tactile sensations and reactions. We recorded, grouped, and classified our mental processes, end quote. And indeed, eventually, digging in the archives, a story of a very special female student that changed the course of literature and writing emerged from the laboratory. Gertrude Stein was one of these women. She was, in 1893, Stein studied experimental psychology with William James and Hugo Monsterberg. For three consecutive years, she engrossed herself in experiments that made use of psychological technology. Gertrude Stein became Monsterberg's most favorite and ideal student and benefited very much from the inquiry into mental life that the lab offered her. She wrote in the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas about this experience and said, and I'm quoting from Gertrude Stein, we worked out a series of experiments in automatic writing under the direction of Hugo Munsterberg. The method of writing that I afterwards developed in my book, Three Lives and the Making of Americans, showed itself first in this lab, end quote. The reports of these investigations, which I was happy to find, was the first text that Gertrude Stein ever wrote. And they confirm her own sense of how this experimentation had shaped her future work. Gertrude Stein was led to practice an analytic method, which she said was of a decidedly rhythmic character. And this included, as she put it, an unconscious exercise of memory and invention, an activity, she said, that had a marked tendency to repetition, end quote. 
She absorbed this experimental, and I would argue cinematic, technique of observation of external and internal reality and reproduced it exactly in her writing, which is formed on this rhythmical repetition of a very minimal undulating, as if it was a wave writer style of writing. In listening carefully to the pulse of Gertrude Stein's sentence structure, one hears a specific silent sound, the repetitive, mechanical, insistent, intermittent noise made by the laboratory instruments of the new psychology. Here is the echo of these resounding objects designed to graph, to wave the slightest variation in repetition, things, object, fashioned to trace wave patterns and fabric of our flowing mental life. In this vibrating, animated, material existence of the objects of mental design reverberated in Gertrude Stein's words, bearing a trace. For Gertrude Stein, the techniques of the scientific lab became a method, an instrument for writing. And so the observational tools of the new psychotechnology, the mechanism of mental life probed in Munsterberg's laboratory, actually became instrumental in creative and innovative and even modernist writing apparatus. To conclude, the instruments activated in Hugo Monsterberg's laboratory contributed to the design of a form of new knowledge because they rendered thinkable modern ways to inhabit sensible worlds and mobilize mental space. The aesthetic materiality of these objects, which traced motion, sounded out inner rhythms, configured surfaces, styled and circulated new artistic shapes to suit a psycho technology. As this graphic design of mental life developed, it migrated, becoming not only thinkable, but also representable in cinema, which turned experiments into experience. Haptic instruments of inner observation transformed the very texture of moving images. Having observed the pre-cinematic design of Hugo Monsterberg psycho laboratory, one can then return to his 1916 book on film theory and grasp the full importance of the photoplay, now positioned in the context of his laboratory and set in the company of all its instruments of knowledge and writing. In particular, I would like to see this work positioned in the gallery of measuring instruments because they impart something about the impact of cinematic technology. That is, they illustrate how cinema takes part in the art and technology of modern subjectivity. In the end, I would like to imagine this entire apparatus displayed in the context of a museum exhibition of Munsterberg's laboratory, mobilized again in conjunction with film. I'd like to reinvent it in the form of an imaginary art installation because the joint emotional machinery would convey not only the disciplining side of measuring, but also the measure of fascination mobilized in the motion of emotion, a transitive, subjective force that can confound even scientific discipline. When Monsterberg film theory is imagined in this way, surrounded by all these objects, moving and animated in a kind of imaginary, revived art installation, the ideas themselves could start to spin, because psychotechnology sustained a vision of film theory, itself genealogically designed and materially fashioned as a laboratory of real moving images, that is to say, as an actual art of projection. Thank you. Questões? Vamos bater um papo. Olá. É... Olá. Tudo bem. É, você falou bastante dessa projeção mental e dessa... É, que Deleuze fala dessa tela 
do cérebro, mas não fala dessa projeção da imagem mental que seria, no caso. Né? Aí eu estava pensando, que você está um pouco nervosa, que eu não costumo falar em público, mas eu estava pensando o seguinte, é, vivemos num mundo hipervisual, muito tátil, é, hipersensório, no caso, tátil, olfátil, e uhum. a sinestesia hoje é uma uma, um fenômeno mais que bem-vindo junto à criação artística. O que você pensa essa relação do fenômeno sinestesia e relação com criação artística ou cinema no cinema no caso? Um, thank you for um, a very interesting and large uh, and large uh, question uh, that that you give me. Um, I, the reason why I was, I'm interested in, uh, in this is because it, this kind of pre-cinematic research, uh, to my mind, uh, very much involves something that I see happening in what, what my call today post-cinematic times. So I like, in a sense, to put together these two moments, the moment of the emergence of cinema along with all of these new forms of vision and technologies for imagining not just images, but to, for imagining the form of imaging of our mental life, because there was a tremendous amount of excitement, I think, around the creation of all of these uh, sensations and, and possible connections and ways of seeing. And I see something happening now that, in a way, reminds me of this in a new form. Uh, every time some kind of uh, technological moment emerges that expresses a form of sensorium relations to uh, the, te the techniques that goes beyond it, some, some interactions happen. Uh, so I'm interested in particular in, this, in the moment of the invention of cinema because I, I think you can see there that, that sense of relation. I mean, in this, uh, in a way, the idea of the, um, let's see if I can. No, going back to the, the, well, whatever, the film as a screen, as a projection, is a very forward-looking something. As we imagine, the more and more so, we have these technologies attached to our bodies, and they're coming even into our brains. You know, they might not be that far away uh, the moment in which we no longer will even need a screen, but the, it will be you know, somewhere part of this. We already have the phones coming into every direction, our pictures, our memories, our pictures, the moving images are related to the way in, in which we experience and record ourselves. So I was particularly interested in looking at this uh, moment as a kind of, because this form of media archaeology, I think, can teach us a lot about how a, a, an instrument that's not only a technique or a technology is actually connected to the larger sense in which we experience ourselves, our subjectivity and the world in connection also uh, to, uh, to, the visual, to the visual arts. Um, the question about the arts is, uh, is part of uh, some other research that I'm doing now that's especially present in, in uh, the book surface. I, I didn't, uh, this was already you know, a lot, I didn't want to put that much uh, in there, but I'm interested in particular, uh, for example, of the way in which at, at this moment, the experience of, of the enlargements of the frame, you know, film panoramas or phantasmagorias or a number of, of actual experiences of project, real projections of things that, that were invisible, ghosts that became present, you know, or, and how the technology, in a sense, can make material something that's not just physical, but it also is internal and invisible. So this relation between materiality and immateriality, uh, I think is a very important uh, connections in the arts. And it's something that I see very present in, uh, in the way in which all of this research was connected to panorama paintings, to phantasmagorias, to different kinds of aesthetic experiences of, of, of forms of panoramic perceptions where all of the synthesis of the senses were coming together at that time. And that today, what I'm noticing in the work of contemporary artists is, despite the fact that everyone talks about how our world is becoming more and more virtual, 
I actually find that we experience materiality, we have been experiencing materiality in virtual form for about 100 years or more, and that there is a kind of sense in which on the screens uh, and in the ways in which artists are positioning cinema outside of cinema, remaking installations that look like panorama paintings, thinking about screens as these multiple forms of projections, as these mechanisms that are closely involved with our mental flow and trying to express in a way materially this form of invisible existence is becoming uh, more and more uh, present. So, you know, so I'm interested in artists like uh, Anthony McCall or James Turrell, people that, that talk about, for example, the perception of light the materiality of light itself uh, becoming present, which is the material base of, of, of cinema in many ways, light and darkness, and how all of these uh, forms of expressions, which for Monsterberg were about colors and sound and sensations and expressions, uh, are becoming uh, interesting to artists that work with visual technology uh, today. And Last but not least, you, you mentioned Deleuze. Uh, I was very interested when I was doing this work on Monsterberg that seemed, you know, in a way, very far away, right, from Deleuze, but in a sense, more and more uh, reading Deleuze, and especially an interesting interview that, that he gave uh, where he talked about the power of the cinematic uh, apparatus being something beyond the actual physical motion, but he says it's about the, almost the spiritual idea of the, the movement of the experience that, that that gives, and he says that's the power of cinema, and in that respect he talked about the brain as a screen. So something that's not cognitive only, but that involves the entire work of the, of the, the sensory imagination. Um, so on the one hand, there is this, this kind of you know, interesting sort of sense of neuroesthetics that, that is connected to the flow uh, of the senses and the, and the sensual and the idea of the, the brain and, as a screen in that respect. But on the other hand, Monsterberg was also in a way anticipating um, some more pragmatic uh, experiments that neuroscience is doing today in terms of the brain as the screen. Now, very, the scientists are, are, neuroscientists are often using the kind of the idea of the circuits uh, in the brain as being nerve patterns connected to the actual circuits of a computer screen. And so this is all of these metaphors that are working together. Um, and they're also, in a sense, the, the idea of Munsterberg of looking for the material base of knowledge, you know, testing the body and trying to find places in which in the head of somebody that could be a memory. You know, it seemed crazy at the time, but neuroscience is obsessed with this in a way that's almost like, to me, very narrow-minded, as if, you know, with all of this image technology, you could actually enter inside the brain and say, here, here is memory located. You know. I find that to be both fascinating and problematic. And to my mind, uh, again, you know, as I'm looking at this moment of modernity and pre-cinema in relation to what's happening in post-cinema, in the, in the con new conjunction between new technology, scientific discourse, philosophies, and the kinds of questions that are asked, uh, this idea of, of, of the mental projection became to me a very interesting way to, uh, to connect the two. I've exhausted your questions with very long answers. I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Hold on, let me put this back in. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Oi, é, obrigado. No, eu queria, na verdade, é, fazer uma pergunta em cima dessa ressonância do, dessa, dessa palestra sobre Mustenberg com o trabalho do Gilles Deleuze. Quer dizer, o Gilles Deleuze usa a matéria e memória do Bergson, que também está interessado é, nessa relação entre o, o aparato mental um, e... Quer dizer, para o Bergson, o cinema não era um modelo. Né? É, é, é mais ou menos essa a, a pergunta que eu quero fazer. O, uhum. Por que o Deleuze não teria usado diretamente o, o Hugo Mustenberg, é, já que há uma ressonância nessa ideia do, do cérebro como tela, né? no, no, no trabalho do Deleuze e no trabalho do Hugo Mustenberg? Mas o Deleuze 
se voltou para Bergson e não para Mustenberg. Essa é a minha questão. Uhum. Quer dizer, e aí, yes. é, a, em, em, em adendo a isso, é, quando você coloca essa semelhança entre um momento pré-cinemático e um momento atual pós-cinemático, em termos de, uma, de, de, de teorias psicológicas, de uma teoria do aparato mental, de uma teoria do sujeito uhum. psíquico, isso não... não não seria um fenômeno paralelo a, ao fato de que, entre Mistenberg e a psicologia cognitiva, o, o que você tem, pelo menos numa certa teoria do cinema ligada aos anos 60, 70, o que você uhum. tem é a prevalência de modelos psicanalíticos em que o aspecto sensorial não é tão importante assim, e o mais importante é o aspecto semiológico, o trabalho do Christian Metz, que, que junta a semiologia com, 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 com psicanálise... Uhum. E etc. O, 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 o que, que acontece com, com o trabalho do Deleuze, que me parece que ele não está nem num grupo nem no outro? Quer dizer, o, o Mustenberg estaria uh, uh, ligado à, à psicologia associacionista e cognitivista, uh, e o Deleuze usa Bergson. Por que o Deleuze usa o Bergson e, e não o Hugo Mustenberg? Ok. Thank you. Um... I um, I agree with you that it was a provocation um, that I made to make this leap. Uh, yes, Deleuze does not, as far as I know, does not use Munsterberg, uh, but he goes to Bergson, as you said, to to talk about cinema in terms, especially of uh, the phenomenology of cinema and the temporality of film. Uh, but there is uh, so it was a leap I wanted to make because. Of course, everyone has been discussing the fact that Deleuze uses Bergson. It's, it's very well known, and I didn't need to repeat something that somebody else had done very well. And I was interested in the fact that, despite the fact that Deleuze is not using or even knew Monsterberg, that there is this kind of interesting connection that has to do with the projection of the mind. And there is, in Berg, although Bergson, in a sense, did not use uh, cinema as a model, he did say, Some, somewhere a very, very, I think, essential, important uh, phrase that the mechanism of our everyday experience is of, our cinema, is of a cinematic kind. And I've always liked that sentence because, in a sense, despite his lack of interest, in a sense, and in, in that, what you do have is the idea that the mechanism itself of everyday life is of cinematic time. So I saw the connection there. It's not, you know, and it was interesting that you brought it up because it's underneath the thinking and it goes into a very short sentence in, the, in this uh, text, but it had a lot to do with traveling in a way through the idea of the mechanism of the human experience of human emotion as being of a cinematographic kind, but the everyday life mechanism that Bergson recognized and gave to the cinema, which traveled to my mind to Deleuze. And that's where I saw the, the a connection that was not made, that it is not made anywhere, potentially happened. And so I like sometimes you know, to connect together things that don't, that are not connected, or they seem disconnected, and sometimes there is a friction. You know, it's kind of pushing something, you know, and I'm, I'm pushing something here. Um, as for the second part of your question, Uh, yes, um, Munsterberg has, is in fact connected to cognitive psychology and to the way in which cognitive science and cognitive studies, even in film, understand such processes. Um, I don't find that work to be extraordinarily interesting. So what I was doing here, again, polemically, is to stay away from the Munsterberg of the, of the cognitive pragmatic experiments and into this kind of boring mechanics that sometimes cognitive psychologists employs by saying, here's the reaction. You go like this, that's an affect, you know. And, and trying to, de to reconstruct um, the, the, the humus, the cultural humus, the more interesting moment where despite Monsterberg himself, in a way, and his tendency to want to go in that direction, things were happening. So that there was, he was not interested in psychoanalysis, but there was the hypnotic chair. You know, why was this hypnotic chair there? What was happening in this form of mesmerizing uh, the ideas? And 
to me, the, that's why I insisted on just the work of the Harvard Psychological Laboratory, because it was very connected to William James, less connected to the pragmatic cognitive studies that it became and it led to, certainly, and, and therefore to the rediscovery of Munsterberg now in cognitive studies, and more related to a larger framework that had a lot more to do with, uh, with a form of men, ec philosophical experimentation that was larger, and that to me was more connected to the frame of mind of William James, who I find extraordinarily interesting as a philosopher and a psychologist, and to uh, actually kind of almost reversed you know, some of these ideas because he was interested in the way in which the, the body can become a language for affect and how affect actually have a form of sensational experience and memory and imagination in ways that go far beyond, and in a fluid idea, that go far beyond the kind of you know, mechanics of the pragmatism that became uh, the cognitive science. And, with this interesting question, you also touched upon the limit of, 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 of this. You know, I uh, was telling Tadeo, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this and I wanted to write a small book, but I stopped because I really didn't like the, the, I, the pragmatic aspect of it. And I, I was not interested in getting into it. And that, that's why I sort of wanted to rediscover this moment when there was an aperture uh, to worlds. Uh, and when there was even an aperture to aspects that James was interested in, like uh, phenomena of animation, of the way in which the spirit of cinema is, is in fact actually connected to, to things that one cannot even cognitively understand. I mean, as a psychologist, William James knew that. He did not stop at the cognitive. He went far beyond it. Uh, in a realm that was not psychoanalysis, but very, very involved in a form of even animism or, or, or attention to, uh, to, to the spirit that animates things. And I'm very interested in this uh, conjunction. And I, and I think in the, in the early experiments of the lab, all of that was there. And then at a certain point, you know, Monsterberg himself led a different path and, went and became more interested in, in this idea of modern fatigue, in applying the ideas to the experiments. And, and that's the direction that cognitive studies have taken and the reason why they are reclaiming some of his later work, which I find less interesting. You know. And the film book is, is fascinating in that respect because he wrote it at the very end of his life, you know, after all the work um, in, in that was more pragmatic, but to me it was it, it, it was interesting because it it sort of connected him back to the origin of where he started from, you know. So when, before he died, this is an apocryphal story, but I rather for those of you who are academics, I rather like it. Um, he be, he had a lot of contrast with the university and stopped going to faculty meetings, uh, and uh, and which meant that he had lots of wonderful time to think. And uh, he walked into a film theater and and saw this new medium, which he wrote in a uh, in an interview. He he was told that as a Harvard professor and philosopher, he should not be interested in this you know lowly kind of form of mass entertainment. But as he walked in there, he discovered that everything he had been thinking about was right there, you know, represented in this new medium. And so paradoxically, it took him back to the origin of his research. And so I was interested in the fact that the 1916 book, although it comes after all of the cognitive work, speaks about inner or outer development, attention, memory, imagination, and emotion, all kinds of categories which were the actual categories in the early 1890s where the research of James and his own research had developed from. So cinema made him, in a sense, reconnect back beyond the cognition and beyond the pragmatism to this more interesting moment of research where philosophy, aesthetics, and psychology were working in, 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 in connective grounds. And even Tracy in, let's say, the geography of where the lab was at the university meant something to me because it was created in the philosophy department. So that you realize that at that time, the humanities and philosophy was not disconnected from, from science. And that's something that interests me, that, that in terms of a kind of an epistemological quest that goes beyond the, the narrow-minded you know, experimentations on, on pragmatic facts. And so 
So yes, so, so all of that, you know, beyond like the, all of this, and thank you for the question. Um, Oi. É, eu queria entender melhor, assim, porque a sua passagem foi muito rápida sobre a Gertrude Stein, é, de que modo uhum. o trabalho da Gertrude Stein no, no, no laboratório do Mustenberg influenciou o ato de escrita dela? De que modo é, isso se tornou um método para ela que modificou a escrita dela? E, e essa relação com a repetição mecânica que você falou, mas eu não entendi muito bem assim, exatamente o, o, que, o quê. Ok. Uhum. Um, that's uh, uh, a, a, a leap of faith, and I'll, I'll tell you what, what I think about this. When I, when I discovered the idea that, that, that Gertrude Stein was a student, I, it, was, it was fascinating to me for several reasons. You know, one is that I was, I was looking for ways in which this work did not stop, but could impact something, generated something. So it, it generated something that had to do with understanding film and film theory, which was already rather enormous. But then, then it seemed like uh, that it had an impact on this very interesting uh, woman. And so here is, here is what I think about it. And it, it's an interpretation uh, that I gave uh, in, in passing in this. Um, she, she took classes for three consecutive years. But that's a lot, right? I mean, for, a, for somebody involved to, and, and she spent a lot of time in this lab and collaborated in making experiments and writing about them. So it was not a, an insignificant part of the formation of, of a writer you know, to be involved in this. And why was she so fascinated uh, by this? So I went and looked at, her, at the papers that she was actually writing as a student. And, and they are descriptions, in a way, of, of the ways in which um, psychic phenomenon work, but she was interested in a sense in the resonance of this uh, phenomenon. But one thing struck me, struck me, strikes me in, in this that's even uh, more interesting. It's not just the fact that it was part of her cultural formation, which was already interesting to hear our writer that's known to be such, in a sense, can be informed by a, a scientific imaginary. So it was not the courses on creative writing that made her, but the, the experiments in a lab, right? So that's already something. But that I thought, actually, it went further. Um, it went further because I saw that she was, in a way, describing that she had this interest in the fact that studying in the lab, you had to be very intent in observing something over and over again. And that in the lab, in the lab itself, there was a kind of sound that the object made, like a, a noise, because they moved. I mean, here they're like, you know, they're pictures, so they start. That's why I wanted to make an art installation. I'd like them to move. And to show this sort of repetitive movement, because you had to do it over and over again, and they themselves made a kind of repetitive sound. And you had to observe situations that only the slight diffraction would let you know that there was a difference in it, right? So it was, it was not tremendously different, but like you saw somebody doing, moving an arm in a certain way, and then it meant that a kind of an emotion had a particular object. So it was really about the intent observation of a phenomenon in repetitive way that had to show a slight form of diffraction. And if you look at not the just the object of her writing, but the style of her writing. There's something about the way her modernist work is, is about slight repetition and diffraction. You know, so that I, I thought, in my, in my own sort of way of reading this, that it went beyond just being formed by a subject, but in a sense became the subject of writing. And, and then there's that instrument that I like, the style writer, which I'd like to have. You know, sort of something that graphs this possible movement. And in a way, I sort of, in my own imagination, imagine this young woman you know, being able to use it and figure out a way to create a form of writing that is, in fact, you know, based on this kind of repetition. Let me, there is a, I can do this, if I can find it. I can actually read you a piece that might uh, that might make it um, 
And this, this uh, as Beth and Bob, Nerstrud Stein. Okay. So here's a, like well, how she writes about geography, right? And, and so the idea of repetition and intermittence and repetitive thing. As geography returns to geography, return geography, geography comes next. Geography as nice comes next geography. Geography as nice comes next geography comes geography. Geographically, geographical, geographically to place, geographically in the case, in the case of it. Looking up, under fairly, see fairly looking up, under as, to movement. The movement described, an interval. If he needs, if he needs, if he needs, do more, do not more, do not touch, do not touch. Here is what she's looking for, less, less threads. Fairly nearly and geographically in water, descriptive geography, geography and geographically inundated, geography and inundated. I stand for Italy, G stands for geography and geographically, I touched it as through geography includes inhabitants and vessels. So that's the rhythm. You observe, repeat slight change, something moves. Yeah. So I like to think that it was three years of doing this that led her um, to think that way. But it's an interpretation. I don't think I've, I've seen any literary critics saying it. So <laughs> I, I, uh, I just, uh, yeah, it's, it's a way of observing. Oi, boa noite. Uh... É, eu fiquei, é, eu percebi dois eixos na, na sua fala e não sei se percebi bem, mas parece que um vai está relacionado com a mente tecnológica, né, e na, nos artifícios que como extensão natural do corpo, não como uma extensão, é, enfim. E, e uma outra, um outro vetor seria a forma como você estrutura sua estruturou sua fala aqui hoje, que parece aludir a um, um lado lúdico, é, não sei também se eu estou equ equivocada, mas parece aludir a um lado lúdico da pesquisa, não é? E talvez até uma crítica em relação à segmentação do conhecimento, ou, ou da forma de se produzir conhecimento, não sei. Eu queria perguntar sobre isso para você, se você é, considera que há uma um problema a ser resolvido é, por exemplo, onde estaria hoje esse laboratório? Não é? Se ele fosse realizado hoje, se ele estaria em artes... Ou se ele... Parece que há uma crítica por trás da sua fala, por um lado, e, e ainda uma terceira questão, que é, parece que a, as descobertas que você fez, as descobertas que você fez foram tão profundas, é, tão delicadas ao mesmo tempo, que é, talvez é, fique um a gente consegue captar apenas a superfície, né, numa palestra assim. Mas eu fiquei curiosa para saber sobre essa questão do, 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 de uma opção política por trás da, da sua fala, né? Porque você fa você cita o, o, o pesquisador e você fala dele no, no também se relaciona com as exposições, né? Você puxa esse contexto de, de artes. E, ao mesmo tempo, você, você mas você não mostrou para mim uma posição assumida em relação a, a isso, a uma segmentação. Você não segmenta essa apresentação desse conhecimento, ao meu ver. Então, é, eu queria saber sobre isso. Se você acha que é, esse atravessamento das artes ou de outros conhecimentos de forma mais lúdica, como se apresentou é, nessa pesquisa poderia hoje ser interessante essa multiplicidade e que esse pesquisador apresenta. Não sei se deu para entender. Um, 
I'm not entirely sure I, I, I totally understand, but, um, but, but I, 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 let me, correct me if I didn't, and then I'll try to answer what I thought I understood of, of, of your question. Um, well, for, I mean, first of all, thank you. Yes, there are different layers underneath this uh, uh, that are coming to the surface in some way. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure that there is a critique or a criticism uh, per se, or a polemic in this, but there is more, in a sense, a desire, and, a, and a actually almost like a struggle and a resistance you know, that, that is played out. Uh, as I look at the material and I, and I try to make something that could have been analyzed as a, as a series of scientific discoveries and, or interesting discoveries, and that would have been enough Right, to write something, you find out all of this, it's okay, it's enough. But to, you read, I think, interestingly, that for me it's not. And so it's not just the object, but I like to write in a way uh, that, um, that also shows as much as possible the process of the research. And also, I write often um, in, a, in a way that, that actually um, uh, fictionalizes theory at a certain level. So I'm, I'm not, uh, and here it, it was difficult because I was dealing with material that in a way was skirting a lot of, of things like cognitive, pragmatic, and so there was an impulse, there might have been an impulse, you know, to present this as a series of, of, of facts and discoveries that would have been interesting enough, but that's really not my style. I'm much more interested in a way of, and, in, in making this kind of trajectory through the work and, and using some forms of sort of intellectual flannery in a way, sort of connecting together, going off into paths, finding others and, and coming back uh, into it. And also, uh, as much as possible, showing the form of passion that that is involved in doing this kind of research. So not just what you discover, but how you get to a certain place and also what paths you take and what you don't. You know, So to which extent one might have stopped uh, at, at the pictures of the laboratory and say, oh well, you know, there were no women here. Women could not go to Harvard, so that's it. You know, but in a sense, I think in that part of, of the talk, you could sense that uh, the going beyond is something to do with my impulse as much as with the material. So even working against the material to sort of delve in places where uh, where I'm interested in, in making connections and, 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 uh, and discoveries and, and also finding out a territory for myself. You know, I'm, not, I'm somebody who's more interested in aesthetics and in the arts than in science. Uh, this is in a way a kind of uh, 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 a tangent territory that I, that I came into as I was working on this book, which Atlas of Emotion, and the more I wrote about Munsterberg, the more I realized there was something more there that couldn't fit in that chapter, it couldn't fit in the footnote, I had to do something about it uh, someplace. And, and it also had to do with um, understanding the place where I work. You know, it was sort of here's the university where these things are happening, where, uh, where the first book of film theory was written. You know, why here? What is the actual history, intellectual history that lies behind it? So there are several questions, in a sense, built into this that have something to do uh, also with the way in, in which I, I insert myself in the research or I lead it and I want to make that visible. You know, that's why I speak in the first person in, in places and I make clear you know, why, why this. And uh, I, I sort of believe Foucault's idea that history is not objective. The most important thing is that you make clear your point of view, you know, the position out of which you speak. So that's important to me. And I also have a love uh, for, for, for the actual process of writing. So I, I try to write in a way, this was hard here because of the material, uh, but it works a lot better in surface. I try to write in a way where I sort of render the surface materiality of the work that I'm uh, interested in, in, in the style of writing itself. Um, not an easy feat because English is not my first language. I'm, I learned it later in life as an adult, but perhaps because it is a foreign language, uh, it allows me to to be 
to create things, to be playful, to, to learn it enough to be able to move it and, and to make trajectories of, of language that, that are part of a sort of narrative of the research that's also about discovery. You know? So I tend to write in, in a montagist way, in sections that, that advance something, you think it's over, and then there's another path that shows in that shows you how you can go in a different directions. And sometimes the whole thing uh, be, becomes then a, a kind of phantasmagoria of, of space. In this case, because of the, the directive of the research, it was, it was harder to do uh, uh, in a way. So I, I actually uh, uh, both enjoyed it and had uh, difficulty with this because of the several different paths that I that I was taking that I could have taken and also sticking in a way with the object itself of of the research which could have been very dry you know I mean, in a way uh, there's something extremely disciplining and and disciplined about about this and so the the I I try to confine this with a style of writing that uh, that creates different waves you know of motion and. I hope that answers what you were. <laughs> finalizar. Uh, antes de finalizar, eu gostaria de convidar também para a terceira conferência do Arnaud Maier, que vai ser chamado sobre o espelho negro, que vai ser na no campus da Praia Vermelha, no auditório da CPM, da CPM na ECO, na próxima sexta-feira, às 17 horas. Não, na próxima sexta-feira, dia 17, às 18 horas. Estão todos convidados. E gostaria de agradecer imensamente a bela fala da professora Juliana Bruno e convidá-la para voltar no próximo ano com o possível lançamento do livro dela. Obrigado pela participação e obrigado também por pelas respostas, que também foram bem luminosas. Obrigado. Tchau, tchau. Thank you. Thank you, Tadeu, for this, and thanks, everybody, for such stimulating questions that really made me think. Um, I appreciate it. Have a good night. <laughs>